Uh, Alan literally needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Uh, Alan uh, holds the uh, Gordon S. Rentschler Memorial Professorship of Economics uh, at Princeton. He is uh, recently a joint appointment with the Woodrow Wilson School after uh, many years uh, in the economics department. Uh, he's been on the faculty at Princeton since 1971. From January 1993 through January 1996, uh, he served in the U.S. government, uh, first as a member of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, then as vice chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He's the author of co or co-author of over seven, of 17 books, uh, including a textbook which is now in its 10th edition, uh, Economic Principles and Policy with uh, uh, Will Bommel. Uh, I'm pleased to say I'm one of the two million students who learned economics from his textbook. Uh, it actually was not assigned in a class that I had, but my wife used it in a class. Uh, and I enjoyed reading it so much that I feel like I'm one of the two million uh, to have used the book. Uh, he's also published many uh, scholarly academic articles. Uh, many of you may be familiar with some of Alan Blinder's uh, more popular writings. Uh, he wrote for many years for Business Week. Uh, currently, he writes uh, for the New York Times on, uh, in, in the Sunday business section. He appears regularly on PBS Nightly Business Report uh, and semi-regularly on CNBC, CNN, uh, Bloomberg Television. Uh, Alan earned uh, a BA, uh, sorry, AB a degree from Princeton University, uh, a Master's of Science from the London School of Economics, and his PhD from MIT. I wanted to er add a couple of personal notes. Uh, first, Alan is a regular tennis opponent of mine, and I can reveal that uh, I play Alan in tennis regularly, partly for the exercise and partly for his economic commentary. Uh, it's my opinion that uh, no one has written more presciently or I would add more consequentially uh, about what to do about this financial mess than my colleague Alan Blinder. Thank you. What he didn't say is because the main reason is he usually wins. Uh, he's a good deal younger than I am, as is evidenced by what textbook he had for uh, uh, economics. Uh, the uh, advertised talk for the uh, title for this talk was Origins of the Financial Mess, which you see is the second line. It occurred to me as I was preparing for the talk that indeed almost everybody goofed. Uh, so there, this is going to be a long list of uh, culprits who dropped the ball. This guy just dropped the ball. If you want to know who that guy is, he's almost everybody, uh, as you will see as we uh, go along. Uh, so where are we now? Uh, we're in the, in the midst, I'd like to say at the end, but I don't believe that. I don't think anybody believes that. In the midst of the worst financial meltdown, and that's not too strong a word to use, uh, since the 1930s. Uh, the point is, you can't get into a mess like this from just one person or one institution or one set of institutions uh, failing to perform as they should. Uh, errors must have been massive and multiple to get into such a bad uh, position, which is why there are going to be so many uh, people and institutions uh, in my rogues gallery. Uh, not only that, but we do have safeguards built into the financial system, and these safeguards must have failed. There are safeguards. There are lifeguards around these swimming pools who occasionally take naps uh, or go on long coffee breaks or are just too lazy to get off their hammocks. And we had a variety of those as well. So all this leads to the two questions that I'm going to focus on uh, in this uh, talk. And by the way, especially for, uh, I see a number of my students who already heard me for an hour and a half this morning. This will be shorter. Uh, this will be much shorter. More like 40, 45 minutes, I think. So. The, the two central questions for today are what went wrong, and the short answer is a lot. And secondly, uh, what needs to change in order that those things don't go wrong again. Mind you, other things will go wrong. The world in general and the financial world in particular are full of hazards. Um, uh, there's a veritable industry uh, creating more hazards by the week, although it's somewhat in remission right now. 
they're going broke, uh, but they'll be back. But lots of things need to change, so uh, I'm going to give you a long list. This is not just going to be about finger pointing, although the title The Origins suggests that. It will be about finger pointing, but the purpose of pointing the finger is really not at the people, but at the failures and what, therefore, we need to do to make sure these failures don't happen again. And the short, the short two-word answer is many things need to change. So you're going to get a long list. I want to say, however, it's not a conclusive, uh, not an all-inclusive list. There are other things that sort of didn't make the cut for a 40-minute uh, uh, talk. The other thing this, uh, in preparing this talk reminded me of is a quotation from Will Rogers, which you may or may not have heard before. Sometime during the Great Depression, Rogers mused, I presume he didn't mean it quite seriously, he was Will Rogers after all, that it was almost worth this depression to find out how little our big men knew. Uh, uh, the only thing different, uh, and it's not very different about this crisis, is that some of our big men are big women. Uh, but in truth, most of them are men, actually. So uh, it's not really very different from Will Rogers' day. Uh, and we're not going to have a depression, although we are headed for a quite serious recession. So let me start with the big men, so to speak. Can you see that? No, that's too dark, isn't it? Uh, that's Tom Hanks portraying Sherman McCoy, uh, one of the masters of the universe in Tom Wolfe's, uh, in, the, in the movie based on Tom Wolfe's novel, The Bon... Bonfire of the Vanities. So the bond market. Most of you will remember that James Carville, the uh, David, Axel, David Axelrod of his day, uh, famously quipped that when he dies and comes back to the earth, he wants to come back as the bond market because it can cow everybody into submission. So I'm starting with the bond market, uh, populated by these so-called masters of the universe. And I want to take the story back to about 2003 which is when the Federal Reserve, in an effort to revive a pretty moribund economy, uh, brought interest rates, all, brought the federal funds rate all the way down to 1%, where it is again uh, today, and then held it there for a while. That meant that safe interest rates were extraordinarily low, and people that were not content, so th that includes these masters of the universe, with very low safe yields, had a stretch for yield. So instead of buying a U.S. Treasury, which might have yielded you 2% or 1.5%, they started looking at junk bonds at 3.5%, Bulgarian government debt at 3.75, making up these numbers, 3.75%, and so on. Uh, the, uh, the apparent math was simple. 3.75 is bigger than 2. Uh, it seemed not to have occurred to enough of these people that there was a reason that 3.75 was bigger than 2, to wit that the 3.75 percent bonds were riskier than the 2 percent bonds. Uh, as that continued, as more and more people stretched into junk bonds, emerging market debt, whatnot, uh, at, in preference to very low-yielding safe assets, the laws of supply and demand being what they are, the prices of those riskier assets rose and the yields fell. And so the amount that you could earn for taking on risk shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. This was one of the huge mistakes that the masters of the universe uh, made. Um, why did they make that? In the environment of the years 2003, 2004, 2005, and into 2006, Lending risk were seen to be minimal. Why is that? If you look back at the history of the last few years, you saw very few defaults of any kind. Didn't matter whether you were looking at emerging market debt, junk bond debt, mortgage-backed securities, mortgages themselves, loans to households, loans to businesses. Default uh, rates were extraordinarily low during that period, and that includes on subprime uh, mortgages and emerging market debt as it says there. Now, if you uh, limited your vision to the last few years, suppose you're at the end of 2005 and you're looking back at the last three years' worth of data, and 
not looking back further, you would conclude, you know, the lending environment's awfully safe. So what's wrong with lending to the Bulgarian government at 65 basis points over treasuries? They're not going to default, and I pocket an extra 65 basis points that I wouldn't get in treasuries. Uh, mathematical models of risk that used extremely short data periods as inputs fed this delusion. So when I said, if you just look, just eyeball them, if you inputted that data into mathematical models, and there were quite sophisticated mathematical models used, but you only inputted a few years of it in an extremely safe lending environment, you, got, you could easily get deluded into thinking you were living in a no most risk-free world, and many of these masters of the universe succumbed to that delusion. That said, the 65 basis points that they were earning, or 35 basis points that they were earning over treasuries, uh, doesn't give very large bonuses at the end of the year. But if you leverage your holdings 10 to 1, 20 to 1, let's do 10 to 1, I can do the math in my head, uh, that 35 basis points becomes 350 basis points. If you do it 20 to 1, it becomes 700 basis points. Now you're talking about a serious paycheck at the end of the quarter. And so leverage was used to magnify the returns, apparently forgetting that they will also magnify the losses when the process starts working in reverse, which, of course, has what, is what has happened. So all of this created what I call the fixed income bubble, which was multifaceted and very large. Went way beyond subprime mortgages, went way beyond mortgages, encompassed LDC debt, junk bonds, and many, many other things. As I and many other economists looked at this fixed income bubble blowing up in the years 2003, 4, 5, uh, many of us concluded that this, was got to, this had to burst. Uh, but that's not a very useful conclusion if you don't know where or when. And, of course, nobody knew where or when. As the history unfolded, it turned out that it burst on the 9th of August in uh, 2007 in the subprime mortgage holdings of a French bank, BNP Paribas. Who would have known that? Nobody. Certainly not the risk managers of BNP Paribas. Uh, certainly not me, and certainly not anywhere, anyone else. The only thing that was predictable was uh, that this was going to burst somewhere, sometime, and it did. So it turned out to be in subprime mortgages. So what do we learn from this, and therefore what should we try to do better? Well, first, we've known since the beginning of recorded history that where human beings are concerned, probably animals also, I just don't know much about animals, uh, self-delusion is a very powerful force. I don't think the animals are much better than we are of this, actually. Um, second thing we've known forever is those who forget history are bound to repeat the errors of uh, history. So we're not supposed to forget history. Hegel reminded us that the one thing we learn from history is that nobody remembers history. Uh, so that's why it's on my list of lessons. Uh, as a prosaic thing, if you're going to build a ma fancy mathemati mathematical model of risk, which many of these companies did, you better put in longer data period than the last three years. Otherwise, you're subjecting yourself to the well-known uh, 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 GIGO phenomenon, garbage in, garbage out. So a lot of garbage went into this, these models, and a lot of garbage uh, came out. Based on incorrect extrapolations of very recent behavior, and finally, very obviously, that excess leverage can be hazardous to your financial health when things turn around. It's great on the uphill climb. It's marvelous and it seems magical. Uh, on the downhill slide, it's not so good. So that's the first set of uh, people who dropped the ball badly, I might say. Uh, the second is us. Uh, I, as I look around the room, a lot of the people in this audience, though not all of them are old enough to remember Pogo who famously uh, said in this cartoon that I reproduced that we've met the enemy and he is us. Uh, lots of ordinary Americans participated in the great housing mania, predicated on the ridiculous proposition that house prices would continue to rise faster than everything else forever. Let me just pause about that for a second. If the price of a house rises faster than everything else forever, it will eventually be bigger than the GDP. 
Okay, so we know this can't go on forever. That doesn't mean it can't go on for five or ten years. It did, in fact, go on for about six or seven years. But at some point, it has to stop. Uh, and one should remember that when taking on a mortgage. So lots of Americans took on what can only be called irresponsible uh, mortgages, especially subprime mortgages and adjustable rate mortgages, or other mortgages as well. As well. Mortgages that could only uh, hope to be paid off if housing prices kept soaring. So this was the nature of the Ponzi game. Uh, you take what was called a 228 mortgage. That's got a low teaser rate for two years, and then it's going to reset based on LIBOR for the remaining 28 years of the 30-year mortgage. Now, by the way, you never heard of LIBOR and have no idea what it means, who determines it, or anything like that. But uh, the broker assures you it'll all be fine. Uh, so you take a 100% mortgage, basically. A few people took more than 100% mortgages, which is really bad. That's really high leverage. By the way, at 100% mortgage, your leverage is infinite. Uh, uh, at more than 100%, you've gone through infinity and came out the other side uh, on, uh, on leverage. So you're highly levered in a mortgage that, when it resets from the low teaser rate, say 4%, to whatever it's going to reset to, say 9%, you can't possibly afford the monthly payments. So what's the idea of doing this? Well, two years from now, the house will be 25, worth 25% more. You then refinance it into a mortgage where you put 75% down. You have nice equity in your house from the 25%, and you refinance it again to a low interest rate mortgage. Well. That's all fine as long as the music keeps playing, but when the musical chairs game ends, uh, you're sitting in an, you, the homeowner, are sitting in an impossible position. So a lot of people put themselves with the knowledge of forethought into these extremely precarious positions. Some were duped into doing it. Those are bringing me to my next slide, the mortgage brokers, uh, and didn't know what they were doing, clearly. So what do we learn from this? Uh, uh, Especially, probably generically, but especially finance, financially, some people need to be in padded cells to be protected from themselves. A lot of people did this to themselves. Now, what does that actually mean concretely? We're not putting people away in cells. It means that we have to have a much tougher and more seriously promulgated regimen of consumer protections. Uh, we have that for drugs. It's hard to buy something that will kill you. It's not impossible, but it's hard. We make it hard to buy something that will kill you. If you take enough of a number of things, it can kill you. But you have to work pretty hard to kill yourself with a drug. Uh, but you don't have to work very hard to kill yourself in the financial sense. And we need to do a better job of that. Uh, that said, nobody should think that by doing that or anything else, we're going to banish bubbles. There will be bubbles in the future. And that's, why, that's one among many reasons why it's important that we maintain and build these safeguards that, I've been, that, I, that I introduced at the beginning, one of which is consumer protection. We're going to meet many others as we go along. So that's the second culprit. Third culprit was mortgage lenders. Now, so I include in that both the banks and the non-banks. Uh, in the subprime world, about 50% of the mortgages came out of banks and about 50% came out of non-banks, which is a very large share for, uh, excuse me, for non-banks. Uh, some of the worst behaviors in these markets came from the mortgage brokers that, who were unregulated. Now, most of these companies are defunct now, not all, but most. But they had something like 50% of the uh, um, subprime mortgage market, and frankly, some of them are a little more than con artists. I don't quite understand, it must be because Rudy Giuliani is not around anymore, why some of these people haven't been paraded in front of the cameras in handcuffs and sent off to jail. I really don't understand why that hasn't. There's a lot of good politics to be made by doing something like that. As Giuliani proved, even if you never get a conviction, you, uh, you get the good politics. But to my knowledge, that hasn't happened. The number of them deserve to be in jail, but not all of them. I want to emphasize that others, and probably, the, almost certainly the majority, were legitimate lenders 
but they used disgraceful, and that's not too strong a word, underwriting standards in deciding who would get a loan and who would not get, get a loan. By the end of this bubble, the answer was, if you could breathe, you got a loan. And so we have things like liar loans, no doc loans. No doc means no documentation. If you've ever borrowed money, you probably have to show some documentation. You have an income. Uh, they ask you what other debts you have and things like that. Not for a no doc loan. And then my favorite, the ninja loans. Uh, ninja is for no income, no job, or assets. <laughs> so I would like to enunciate as a minor theorem of finance that the optimal number of ninja loans granted is zero. There should never be a ninja loan. There's very little prospect for getting repaid on a ninja loan. So you might ask, why did these mortgage brokers put people into ninja loans, not to mention liar loans, no doc loans, etc.? And the answer is mostly that they were gonna, their companies were going to own these loans for about four days and then pass them on to other companies which would put them into pools and securitize them. So as long as the ninja could stay current for four days, and of course he wasn't going to have a payment due for 30 days, so the odds that he wouldn't default within four days were pretty good. Uh, you weren't too worried about the fault. You were just going to pass this uh, hot potato on to the next holder, and that was going to be their problem. Uh, this is going to lead me to the third. Uh, so now I have three lessons here about the mortgage lender. First of all, we should have had, and by the way, we still don't have, a federal regulator for all mortgage lenders. There are state regulations in the various states. There is no federal regulator at all, still to this day, for mortgage lending, and there should be. So if you ask how could the federal government have let this happen, the answer is it had no authority over most of it, which shouldn't have been. Secondly, we need something analogous to, and I'd make the, I would make the analogy very precise, to a suitability standard that stockbrokers uh, uh, labor under. Your stockbroker can lose his license or worse if he puts you into some kind of wild, risky asset that you don't understand and don't really have the financial wherewithal to bear. That's called a suitability standard. So Warren, under the suitability standard, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates can buy anything. Doesn't matter how risky, it's perfectly fine. It's not going to bankrupt them if it goes to zero. And they may make a lot of money on it. But grandma, who's living on Social Security, is never to be put into assets like that. That's a suitability standard. There is no suitability standard now for mortgages. There should be. If someone who is financially sophisticated walks in and said, I'd like a 228 ARM for 100% loan-to-value ratio. I've also got lots of other collateral. I own a business. I got a lot of money stashed in the Cayman Islands and so on. Uh, there's no problem for me uh, on not, either not understanding this or defaulting on it, but I have a business reason, a personal financial reason why I like a mortgage like that. That meets the suitability standard, as long as that's all true. But people that get duped into taking loans like that, that with no idea what kind of liabilities they're taking on, do not meet the suitability standard. And it's a crying shame that we didn't have that at the time, and we still don't. Uh, finally, implicit in what I said about passing on the hot potato, it wouldn't be a difficult regulation, you probably need a law, to require the mortgage originators to hold on to uh, right to maturity, a fraction of loans they originate. The, mo the mode in this business, in, mor in mortgage brokerage, was zero, the fraction you actually held to maturity. Uh, it wouldn't be a major restriction on freedom of enterprise to s make it, say, 10%. So you got to hold 10% of the loans that you originated. That would be some deterrent, not a perfect cure, of course, uh, to the hot potato game. Now, as I've been saying that, you've probably been thinking about the bank regulators. Where were they? Uh, the bank regulators had a double failure. And they, they, the bank regulators were supposed to be one of the important safeguards in this system, and they failed in two dimensions. Taking them in the opposite order that I have them on this bullet point, 
They fail, first of all, in their consumer protection roles. I've already talked about consumer protection. Uh, rightly or wrongly, the uh, responsibility for consumer protection in most areas, and including in this area, has been given to the Federal Reserve. And that's, that's a picture of Federal Reserve headquarters. Uh, and the Federal Reserve, uh, I think the best you can say is they acquitted themselves poorly in this uh, dimension. You could say worse things about them. In addition, the bank regulators, and by the way, it's important here to note that it's not just the Federal Reserve. We have four federal bank regulatory agencies in America and 50 state bank regulatory agencies. Uh, the whole 54 did poorly. Their main responsibility is for the safety and soundness of banks. Banks that make ninja loans are not behaving in a safe and sound uh, way. They should never have been allowed to make those kinds of loans. Maybe a rare exception for some good reason, but basically should not have been allowed to make them. The regulators talked and talked and talked uh, about doing something about that, that kind of lending practices, those kinds of lending practices, and they never did. Now, you might ask, maybe this was all sub rosa and nobody knew this was going on, and that's why the bank regulators let it go. No. Uh, these horrible practices were plainly visible uh, years, and I'm not exaggerating, years before the bust. Probably the most foresighted person in this was Ned Gramlich, who uh, unfortunately died a couple of years ago, uh, who was a governor of the Federal Reserve System, who famously went into Alan Greenspan's office and said, bad things are going on in subprime lending, we ought to do something about it. And I don't know what Greenspan said in reply, but it was the equivalent of saying, the market will take care of it. But those were probably not his exact words, but that was the, uh, uh, that was the sentiment. Uh, and the warnings that were given not only by Gramlich, although he was the most prominent, but by others were simply not heeded. Uh, why not? Well, I can't help thinking it had a lot to do with deregulatory ideology that this, the people who were yelling about this were essentially telling the regulators that they should interfere with the business decisions being made in the private sector. And if you adhere to the right sort of ideology, that is ipso facto a, an incorrect thing to do. Uh, there was probably more to it, but I think that was a factor. By the way, the worst of these loans the ninja loans and things like that, and the biggest volumes in the subprime in, uh, mortgage industry occurred very late in the bubble. This is the way bubbles usually go. The worst abuses come late in the bubble when it's sort of too late to stop them. And th that, by the way, is one reason why most of us didn't really appreciate the size. I remember my first reaction when, when the fixed income bubble burst in the subprime area, thinking incorrectly, well, this is just a small corner of the mortgage market. So how big a deal could it be? When I then started looking at the data, as all of us did, it turned out to be 25% of mortgages, at least of new mortgages. That's, that's a pretty good corner. And it grew very fast at the end. It caught some people, a lot of people by surprise. So what's the lesson here? Uh, Really, I think it's that the regulators need to get serious about their consumer protection and safety and soundness responsibilities. They don't need new authority. The Federal Reserve and the other bank regulatory agencies had, in the year 2003, all the regulatory authority they needed to have stopped this subprime bubble from inflating the way it did. They just didn't use it. So what they need is a kick in the pants, uh, which they've gotten, by the way. Culprit number five, the so-called private label securitizer. What does this mean? Private label means not Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That was public label. Those are the public, or quasi, and Ginnie Mae. The, the pub, Ginnie Mae is a government entity. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have now been nationalized, as probably most of you know. They had this strange, somewhat private, somewhat public uh, uh, structuring. The other mortgage securitizers that were in the business are called private label securitizers, and this is Wall Street, basically. That's a picture of the New York Stock Exchange. These are big Wall Street uh, firms. What did they do? 
They package mortgages into MBS, mortgage-backed securities, and then into more complicated derivatives based on the MBS, such as collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, and CDO squareds, and there, somebody was probably working on CDO cubes when the bubble burst, uh, and they sold them, uh, I'm tempted to say, to suckers, but let's just say they sold them. The reason I don't, I say not just to suckers, is this looks on the face, you might think this is a classic case of Churnum and Burnham. Get a customer, sell them a piece of junk, you'll never see the person again anyway, uh, and you turn them and burn them. That's not right, though, because what we learned when the tide went out, so to speak, and the rocks were uncovered, is that these are masters of the universe, the geniuses that work for these Wall Street firms, actually held a lot of this junk in their own company's portfolios. Uh, that's amazing to me that they some, and this has got to have been part of the self-delusion that I started with at the beginning, because the top firms on Wall Street, Goldman Sachs got out, famously, mostly got out. Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, lots of others, wound up when the music stopped and the musical chairs game ended, actually holding a lot of this junk on their own balance sheets, uh, and so did many of the big banks. So this goes back to the Will Rogers uh, quote about our big men not knowing what they were doing. Uh, so it was not really a case of Churnum and Burnham, otherwise these banks wouldn't have been owning so much, so much of it themselves. What it was a case was risk management practices that were so bad as to be embarrassing. Uh, another thing that really shocked me as this crisis unfolded and more and more facts came to light was how much of this junk was owned by the companies that I just mentioned, especially relative to their capital. Um, a risk manager, a company should think long and hard, in fact, so long and so hard that they never do it, before they have 80% of their capital tied up in one asset class. Because what if that asset class goes south? There goes your capital with it. Uh, but amazingly, a number of these companies had extremely large percentages of their capital tied up in, in a single asset class. So that's what I mean by saying that the risk concentrations were ludicrous. And yet they happen. Uh, so, uh, Calling these practices risk management practices is an insult to the term risk management. Uh, the, one of the quotations that will go down in, uh, in uh, infamy in this uh, crisis came from the uh, former, since fired, head of Citibank, uh, Chuck Prince, who famously said, uh, while the music plays, you have to dance. That was his version of Citibank's risk management uh, program. It's not recommended policy. Excuse me. So what do we learn from that? That risk management practices need gigantic improvements. Risk managers inside companies, these are the green eye shade people that say no, nobody likes these people, uh, need to have more power in these companies. They do now, but they need to retain it. Uh, when things get better. And then I think there are huge questions about whether these exotic OTC derivatives, OTC means over-the-counter, and what that really means is not standardized, whether they serve any useful social purpose. So these, for example, are the CDOs and the CDO squares that I mentioned a moment ago, and there, but there are many other examples. Uh, I believe, and many people believe, that they exist only to generate profits for the investment banks and not for any other reason. Uh, the nice thing, if you're an investment bank, the nice thing about an OTC derivative as opposed to a plain vanilla exchange traded derivative is that comparison shopping is almost impossible. So if you, the potential buyer, walk into company A and they devise for you a custom made, super complicated derivative that takes accountants and rocket scientists three days to figure out, 
you cannot really do that with firms B, C, and D and see who's giving you better pricing. It's impossible. Whereas if you have a plain vanilla security, you can shop it around to six companies and get the best price. Uh, uh, we need more, and I'll mention this again, more of the plain vanilla and less of the exotics. That's another thing we've learned from this crisis. Then there are the rating agencies. There are their names. Uh, they were supposed to be another one of these safeguards, a very important safeguard, and particularly a safeguard for investors. If I'm an investor, I might be a private individual, I might be a pension fund, I might be the sovereign wealth fund of Norway, I could be a lot of people. I'm an investor buying securities. I rely on the rating agencies to tell me what's a safe security, what's a risky security, understanding that uh, for the risky securities, I should get a higher rate of return, and for the safe securities, I should get a lower rate of return. Well, it's being probably too generous to them to say that they failed miserably in the case of mortgage-backed securities, and in particular that they threw AAA ratings around uh, with gay abandon. So a lot of people looked at these securities, upper tran tranches of uh, CDOs and things like that, and say, Moody says it's AAA, so it must be riskless. After all, the U.S. Treasury is AAA, so this must be riskless. Well. They were not riskless by any means. A generic problem that's still with us but is crying out for solution is that these rating agencies have massive conflicts of interest because they are paid by the issuers of the securities. So if we went back to those private label securitizers, when I had the pictures of uh, Wall Street up there before, I don't want to name any of them, uh, they would take the security to one of these companies, or all three of those companies, and negotiate the rating. What that basically meant was something like this. Tell us how you'd rate this or the way you structured it now. The guy says, single A. What do we have to do to make triple A? Oh, just tweak it this way. OK, then they tweak it that way, and they market a triple A security. That was the way these triple A securities uh, were created. The conflict of interest there is uh, obvious and immense. Uh, it's exactly as if one of us professors got paid by their students to determine their grades. We'd have even more A's than we have enough A's already. We'd have even more A's under that system. So what do we learn from this? Uh, this conflict of interest problem needs to be uh, um, faced head on and solved. It's not easy. The obvious thing doesn't work. When you have a market like that, you say, OK, let's make the payment come from the buyers, not from the sellers. That can't work because information is a free good. And once it's out there, it goes everywhere. So the investors are not going to buy, as individuals, the rating agency services. Because once they've rated it for me, they've also rated it for you. So something more clever needs to be done uh, about that. Second lesson is that investors should do their own risk assessments. This is big investors I'm talking about now, uh, not just rely on the rating agencies. Because they're conflicted, but also because they're not the font of all knowledge. It's not like the rating agencies know everything and nobody else knows anything. So that should have been done, but was not done sufficiently. Culprit number seven. Now we're back to the Wall Street firms. Uh, in this process, the Wall Street firms built a mountain of complicated derivatives on top of the mortgages. The derivatives markets were and remain essentially unregulated. And as I mentioned already, the OTC derivatives were sources of gigantic fees. So you have these companies creating these derivatives to make a lot of money at them. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with making money. But these markets get to be extremely large. You, if you read the papers, you probably have read that the CDS market, credit default swaps, has a notional value of $66 billion. Trillion, sorry. Trillion here, a trillion there. $66 trillion. And that's just one type of derivative, unregulated. Uh, this is why Warren Buffett called them weapons of mass financial destruction. Um, 
These companies themselves operated with excessive leverage, sometimes 30 to 1 or more. On the day that Bear Stearns was folded up into a forced marriage with J.P. Morgan Chase, it had a 33 to 1 leverage on its balance sheet. Think about what 33 to 1 means. You better hold safe assets, because if they decline in value 3.1 percent, you have negative net worth if you're leveraged 33 to 1. It's a pretty precarious situation. As if that wasn't precarious enough, the leverage, they also funded themselves very precariously. A lot of it was just overnight borrowing, overnight rates, overnight loans, repos, they were called. And the, the part that was not, most of the part that was not overnight was very short term, one month, three month credit. This puts you, this makes you vulnerable to a liquidity squeeze if you can't roll over your debt. So uh, what used to be, and this was characteristic of what used to be the big five, uh, the five big investment banks in New York, none of which exist anymore, at least in their old form. It's Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Bear Stearns, and Lehman Brothers. Th this was their business model, huge leverage and a very, very short-term uh, financing. Well, what do we learn about this? Well, that's not a very safe business model. Maybe that first lesson is not so important because none of those five exist anymore in their current form, in their previous uh, form. Uh, but this, these kinds of business activities need to be done with less leverage, and we should not forget about liquidity requirements, which we did in the regulatory domain forget about liquidity uh, requirements. Even if you're solvent, if you can't roll over your debt, um, you can be forced out of business which is basically what happened to AIG, for example. And I already mentioned that there's a strong reason for uh, regul regulators to push markets in the direction of standardized exchange-traded derivatives, even though they'll be less profitable for the investment banks. They're, they're much more transparent and uh, uh, therefore easier to uh, get your arms around and, and to control. I'm going to speed up a little. The SEC. So we do have securities regulators who, in this case, seem to have been asleep at the wheel, possibly for ideological reasons. Uh, you'll have to ask Mr. Cox for the uh, actual reason. I don't know. Um, the point, however, is that the basic business model that I just talked about, 30 to 1 leverage and precarious funding relying largely on overnight funds, is a business model that should never have been allowed on that scale. It's one thing if it's done on a very small scale. In addition to that, a fateful decision was made in 2000, the year 2000, regarding regulatory <laughs> derivatives, regulating derivatives. There's been a lot of press about this recently. Uh, the head of the CFTC, the least important regulator, the Commodities Futures Trading Corporation, wanted in the year 2000 or two bring some modest amount of regulation to the derivative markets. Not, not incidentally, by the way, to her own agency, but you know, everybody's always looking for turf. And she was trampled by the more important regulators, the SEC, the Fed, and the Treasury, all of whom told her she was crazy uh, to even think a thought like that. That was a big mistake. So lessons. We need, do need to regulate derivatives. Brooks Lee Bourne was right. Uh, a huge question is how. It's one thing to say we have to bring some regulation to this market. Derivatives are a very diverse, uh, I was going to say asset class. They're not just one asset class. They're many, many different types and uh, many, many different players. It's a world market. Regulating this is not easy. But we need to do better than we've done. Uh, some people say we need to reform the SEC. For example, there's been suggestions to merge the CFTC and the SEC. I don't know about that. It may be that we just need to get a serious head of the SEC who will use the authority that he or she already has. Which brings me to the leadership vacuum. Uh, this is George Bush. Remember him? Uh, as this crisis unfolded, what did we have in America? We had a disengaged president. Just try to think how many 
perspicacious speeches about the financial crisis you've heard from George Bush. It started in August 2007. Um, in addition to that, at first, but certainly no longer, we had a very passive Treasury who was saying some combination of the market and voluntary changes by market participants will take care of this and or Fed, why don't you take care of it instead of us? That, that was the initial uh, reaction by the uh, United States Treasury. Then, the, since then, of course, that has all changed and the Treasury has been incredibly activist doing all kinds of uh, things that I won't take the time to detail here, though I will have a few words to say about the TARP in a moment. Um, sadly, all along, including to this day, nobody has ever even tried seriously to explain all this to the American people. This is a disgrace, frankly. We asked the representatives of the people to appropriate $700 billion for the TARP and never really explained to the people why. Uh, this, to me, as a small d Democrat, this is unbelievable, actually, that it didn't, uh, that it didn't happen before the TARP bill was passed, and it still hasn't happened to this day. Nobody has done that. It makes you wonder about whether there ever was a plan. It's certainly the case that if there ever was a plan, it was never articulated. Again, continuing to this day, it's not been articulated. Now, uh, in fairness, I'm not that really inclined to be fair, but uh, with, with this particular crowd, but in fairness, that would have been hard. This has been a multifaceted, ever-changing crisis breaking out uh, here, there, and the other place. The analogy has been made by me and many other people to the game of whack-a-mole, that you fix, you knock this mole down, then another one pops up. So articulating a, a fully coherent plan would have been difficult, but I would have liked to have seen somebody try. I still would on Tuesday, the 11th of November, 2008. I still would like to see somebody try. What do we learn? Leadership can be very important in a crisis. We knew that. Uh, and as we used to tell, as used, your grade school teacher used to tell you when he handed in your math program problems, explain your work. Don't just give us the answer. We heard the answer. Appropriate $700 billion with no restraints on the Secretary of the Treasury. How about explaining your work? Last but not least, oops, sorry, and I'm not going to point a specific finger, though I have a few candidates, whoever decided to let Lehman Brothers fail. We had a serious crisis on September 14, 2008. On September 15, 2008, we had a catastrophe on our hands, and the thing that changed was the failure of Lehman Brothers, which was judged not too big to fail. We've had in the United States and other countries this tacit too-big-to-fail doctrine for decades and decades. It was always left with some constructive ambiguity. Who's too big to fail? Who's not? When Bear Stearns was saved, a company half the size of Lehman Brothers, that seemed to most people, including to me, to put Lehman Brothers way beyond, above or below, however you want to think about it, the too-big-to-fail borderline. If Bear was too big to fail, then surely Lehman Brothers was too big to fail. Apparently not. The other doctrine was the too entangled to fail doctrine. To the extent that there was ever any explanation for the Bear Stearns rescue, it was not based on so much on too big to fail as in too entangled to fail. That is, Bear Stearns was involved with too many counterparties, most of which were hedge funds, by the way, so that if it was allowed to fail, the financial fabric would start coming apart. And that was the argument for Bear. And somebody wanted us to believe that while that was true of Bear Stearns, it was not true of Lehman Brothers. Uh, this was always a hard argument for me to understand, and for many, many other people to understand. And that's much more important. Because what happened on September 15th is that the uh, US authorities, by allowing Lehman Brothers to fail, destroyed any belief in market participants that there were rules of the game. 
Wall Streeters are marvelously adaptable, adaptable and clever people. And by the way, when I say Wall Streeters, half of them work in the city of London and a, another fraction work in Japan and Singapore and so on. They're all over the world. They're concentrated on Wall Street and in the city of London. Uh, and these people looked at what happened and they said, what is this about? What happened to the too big to fail doctrine? Is there any counterparty left in the entire world that's not too big to fail? Whatever happened to the too entangled to fail doctrine? Just like Bear Stearns, Lehman was entangled with uh, thousands and thousands of other institutions. How could we think that they were not too entangled to fail? Um, we learned in, within hours that this notion that they were not too entangled to fail was wrong because uh, within hours, in less than 24 hours, the first retail money market mutual fund in history, quote, broke the buck. These are these things you put in, it's worth a dollar, it's always worth a dollar, it never goes up or down. Well, that's the way it was until September 16th or 17th of this year when the reserve fund broke the buck. Be why? Because of losses they could not collect. They could not collect their counterparty debt from Lehman Brothers. Uh, when the money market mutual funds uh, started to experience runs as a result of this, they started dumping their commercial paper and the commercial paper market failed. At that point, the government jumped in, understanding much too late that Lehman Brothers was much too entangled to allow to fail. So a question that will be asked for a long time was whether this was, uh, whether this was another of those ideologically based uh, decisions that we, we had to make an example of somebody the government was just not going to, because of moral hazard reasons, was not just going to keep propping up uh, <coughs> firms. And, uh, and we had to take somebody out to shoot them, and Lehman Brothers was chosen for the honor. So what do we learn from this? There's an old cliche that says there are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, there shouldn't be any ideologues in foxholes either, for the same reason. Well, not for the same reason. For a different reason. There's no room for an ideologue in a foxhole. So where are we now? We are still in the financial crisis, as it says, which got much, much, wor much, much worse after Lehman Day. We are in the early stages of what looks like it's going to be a long and a deep uh, recession. An obvious point that is barely mentioned, recessions turn good loans into bad loans. So the irony here is that in the first set of episodes in this tragedy, adverse events in the financial and credit markets have damaged the economy. In the second set of episodes, damage to the economy is going to damage the financial markets, the banks and other lenders for the reasons it always has. Loans go bad. Loans that were done with proper underwriting standards, and I'm talking about ninja loans, perfectly sensible business loans, consumer loans, mortgage loans, go bad in recessions. And that has barely started. Um, the Fed and the Treasury, as you know, are now backstopping virtually the entire financial system. The next financial company in line is General Motors. Wait, is that a financial company? Maybe not, but they're in line. And who knows who will be after General Motors? Well, we know Ford, but who, who knows who will be after the, uh, uh, the automakers? Uh, in the campaign, somebody was talking about socialism, but I think that was the other party. Uh, speaking about parties, we are now, as you all know, in a political transition. This, the timing could hardly be worse. We have an outgoing administration with 70 odd days to go, an incoming administration, most of whose personnel has not been named and doesn't have any authority anyway, is basically waiting for January 20th to arrive. Uh, the top, which I mentioned before, the trouble assets uh, relief, relief, Re what's the R? Rescue? No, relief, isn't it? I think so. Rescue? Anyway, one of those. Trouble Asset Relief or Rescue Program is just getting off the ground now, and in my judgment, not very well. 
but I'm going to skip, in the interest of time, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, I have two slides on the top. Unless there are questions, I will come back. I can come back to that. I'm going to skip that and summarize briefly. Uh, one of the cliches in American governance that you never want to hear is this one. Mistakes were made. And yeah, mistakes were made. Multiple, multiple serious mistakes were made. This, in my view, is, as you could tell from where I started the talk, the fixed income bubble was going to burst somewhere, sometime. It was going to cause some difficulties. But it did not, we we'll repeat, did not have to be this bad. Many, many other mistakes were made. Uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, first the credit crisis damaged the economy, and now the economy is going to damage the credit uh, system in a uh, extremely unhappy, vicious circle. The U.S. and the world financial system remains in the EMS stage. So the EMS stage is when the ambulance finds the bleeding body at the side of the road and stops applying tourniquets and, and other emergency methods, uh, other emergency procedures to make sure the patient doesn't die. Uh, unfortunately, we're still in that. Th then the ambulance takes the patient to the hospital where surgeries are performed. We need to get to the hospital. Most of what I was talking about today in this talk were about things to do in the hospital, things we need to do to restructure the system into a safer and sounder system. But we can't do that until we uh, pass through the EMS stage, uh, including repairing the uh, TARP. I skipped over that. I can come back to that if you like. Once we get the patient to the surgical ward, there's a great deal to do. I've been going over that in these various uh, slides as we've progressed uh, through the talk. But first, we need to get him there. We need to make sure the patient doesn't die before you put the patient into surgery. So with all of that, welcome to Washington, <laughs> uh, Mr. Obama. Thank you. So, so Alan has agreed to take take questions. Um, we have microphones. I guess we sh we should probably use the microphones. Is somebody running around. Somebody have well, there's one right there. Oh, you mean come up here? Okay. If, 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 maybe if you form a line. Don't, I don't want to stampede though. If, if, if you can come on down to this microphone if you want to. Come. I think it might be being recorded though. Somebody recording? Is it being recorded? There is a camera. It is. Okay. It's being. Recorded. I'll let you take it from there. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully it's on. Talk. No? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this briefly, Professor. What do you think should be done about the ability of the automakers? The question is about what should be done with, about the big three automakers in the coming weeks or months. Let me give you two answers. Uh, one's the abstract and one's the concrete answer. The abstract answer is I would rather the economy to have been in the position, which unfortunately it's not, where we could just say no. Uh, you made this bed, now sleep in it. Unfortunately, we have an economy where the unemployment rate is rising rapidly. Uh, it seems to me likely to top 8 percent. It may top 9 percent. We'd like that not to happen. This is a very bad time to have a big industry like the auto industry or any big industry laying off thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of workers. So I think we are caught because of an accident of timing in, in a position where we have to do what we can to keep the auto industry afloat. That said, the aid, whatever it's going to be, should be focused on maintaining employment, not maintaining stock market valuations, and should be uh, and there should, unlike the way the TARP has been organized for the banks, there should be a price to pay. Or something such as less um, uh, lower emitting vehicles, as an example, should be the price that the government exacts 
from the companies for the aid that it's going to give them. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's something else, but something. Uh, there is really no case just for handing over cash. I think my question was partly how do you, how do you feel about the uh, request by GM and to um, participate in the TARP? So, oh, the TARP, yeah. Uh, I, I guess the other thing I should add uh, is that as a, again, as a small D Democrat, this should not be done by the TARP. Uh, I mean, there ought to be limits to bait and switch. Uh, the Congress was called into session, was in session, was called to pass this piece of legislation, Troubled Assets Relief, I think, program. It was supposed to buy troubled assets. Do you know how many troubled assets it's bought up to now? Zero. It's been used to make capital injections into banks. Okay, that's legal. It's there's a catch-all phrase, in fact. This is what I wanted to show you. Whoops, this one. Yeah, it is relief. The uh, uh, the Treasury is off. The Secretary of the Treasury is authorized to buy quote any other financial instrument that the Secretary, after consultation with the Chairman of the Fed, by the way, it doesn't say the Chairman of the Fed has to agree. Uh, determines the purchase of which is necessary to promote financial market stability. Under what looks like here Clause 3, they're not numbered that way in the bill, it's perfectly legitimate legal use of the money to inject capital into banks, which is what's been done with it up to now. I don't see anything in there about automobile companies uh, at all. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, if the, sec under the, the wording is so loose that if the Secretary of the Treasury says that the failure of General Motors would uh, endanger financial market stability, he could make that claim, uh, purchasing General Motors debt or equity would be legal under this. It just seems to me, as a small-D Democrat, that Congress appropriated this money for a certain set of purposes, which are mostly items one and two on this list. And the Treasury ought to be a little bit more circumspect about how far it stretches the intent. So I, I would like to see this done outside the TARP. There's a lot of talk about being done inside the TARP, though, as you know. Given the fact that the Wall Streeters now know that when they get into hot water, the Fed's going to bail them out, the public's going to bail them out. What's to stop this from happening all over again, yeah. unless we have some criminal penalties for people who do these things? Yeah, well, I think there should be, but most of what was done was not criminal, except in a figurative sense. In a figurative sense, lots of it was criminal. But in a literal sense, almost none of it was a criminal. Um, I think the answer to that is in that list of lessons that I, was, that I had put at the end of each of those uh, slides. There are changes in the regulatory regime that are needed. There are changes in law that are needed. There is, uh, um, these companies need to operate with less leverage and more liquidity, and a whole variety of things like, and as I said at the beginning of the talk, it wasn't an exhaustive list. But once we get the patient into the surgical ward, there's lots of things that have to be done to change the face of the financial system, and very few of them look like laissez-faire, unfortunately. What do you think of some variation? That says Alaska. That didn't come from Sarah Palin, did it? Well, I've been there. I know Wasilla. <laughs> and, the, and the most auspicious building in Wasilla is Walmart. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, what do you think of some variation of Douglas Eakin's proposal to defer minimum distribution into 2009? Because uh, that pulling converts a paper loss into a real loss. Sorry, a minimum distribution of what? Dividends? A 401k and 401k. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh. And it also potentially allows more money to come in 2009 because if TARP does something, you have more money available as of December 31st, 2008. Yeah. I'm generically allergic to schemes like that, but in this particular circumstance, I'm not. Uh, uh, contrary to what we normally need to do, which is urge Americans to spend more, we now need to urge Americans, sorry, 
which is we need to urge Americans to save more because they refuse to save. We now need them to spend more. Spending looks like it fell off a cliff in September. So I think we have to be thinking of a variety of things to encourage more consumer spending. That could be one of them. Uh, what would you say to those who uh, put forward the idea that uh, negative real interest rates uh, combined with perhaps the too big to fail doctrine itself make an environment which almost has bubbles a, a necessary consequence and if so would we be setting up the next one now? If so, what was the last part? Would we be not setting up the next one now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me talk, take the last part of your question. I don't know what the next one will be. Uh, we're sort of running out of things to uh, blow a bubble in. Uh, there is truth to the matter that super low interest rates, which often mean negative real uh, interest rates, lead to, uh, on, well, first of all, uh, on pure fundamentals calculations, lead to very high valuations of long live assets. You start discounting at a negative rate, you can get a pretty juicy uh, uh, um, fundamental valuation. Now, the key thing there is the expectation of how long that negative real interest rate will last. That's where the danger lies. There are times, and we're in one now, where we desperately need the central bank, the Federal Reserve, and this is true in other countries also, here it's the Federal Reserve, to promulgate negative real interest rates, interest rates below the rate of inflation, to stimulate more spending. The, the art in this is Get, correcting that aberrant situation uh, soon enough. In the, one of the criticisms of the Greenspan Fed was after they lowered the nominal interest rate to 1%, creating a strongly negative real interest rate in 2003, they held it there too long. That's probably right. I consider it a forgivable error, but it was probably an error. Uh, this uh, current macroeconomic situation is far more dire than whatever we had in 2002-03. The Fed's going to need to hold negative real interest rates for much longer, and the art is going to be to not hold them too long. Uh, regarding the AIG bailout, yeah. uh, did the Fed regard uh, the failure of AIG as a much larger uh, destruction of the economy, and was this a logical type of bailout? Now they revised it again. Yeah, uh, on the first, uh, definitely yes. Uh, AIG was probably the biggest single player in this uh, CDS market that I mentioned before, credit default swaps, which were basically insurance policies that would pay off if you were the policyholder if the bond went into default the insurance company would pay. Uh, there are lots of issuers. AIG was the largest. And the fear was that if AIG folded, as it looked like it was going to, uh, that gigantic market would come crashing down, causing disruptions all over the uh, place. So that was the thinking. Was this the most logical way to do it? Certainly not. Uh, this was before the TARP and done in a great rush by the Federal Reserve. What happened in the case of AIG is the central bank of the United States, a bank regulator that never ever has regulated an insurance company, nationalized an insurance company. That's an extraordinary thing, a breathtaking thing to do. The deal was just reworked this morning with some of the money from the top being used to uh, finance part of the AIG bailout. It would have been much better if from the get-go this was done by the Treasury. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, the Treasury either wouldn't or couldn't do it at the time, and the Fed did it. Now they're partners um, in the AIG bailout. So it was not a basically logical way to get it done. It was uh, the kind of thing you do when there's nothing else to do. Annie and Freddie played in the creation of these bundled mortgages. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is actually not much. At the very end, Fannie and Freddie started to dabble more into these exotic uh, mortgages, subprimes, and other things like that. In its history, prime mortgages almost is almost synonymous with conforming. We're now getting to much too tech talk here. 
Conforming mortgages is the term of art for the mortgages that Fannie and Freddie will buy. They have to conform to certain standards. For example, a minimum down payment, uh, decent documentation, uh, real income flows from the mortgagee. Uh, those are called conforming mortgages. Uh, essentially, all the conforming mortgages are prime mortgages, not subprime. So for most of its history, Fannie and Freddie didn't own a single subprime mortgage. Way at the end, as this bubble went into its final days, they got into the game also, partly prodded by members of Congress. Uh, but this was very small beer relative to the whole subprime market. So they were not uh, significant players in the subprime market. To this day, the default rates on the Fannie Freddie conforming mortgages are quite low. They're higher than they were, but they're still very low. So if all we had to deal with was rising defaults on conforming mortgages, we wouldn't have a very big problem on our hands. We'd have a very manageable problem on our hands now. Our accounting systems are supposed to make things reasonably transparent. Yeah. And it seems to me there's a long time between the subprime beginning problem and the final crash of the uh, thing here. And so the question is, was uh, GAP actually uh, used? Yeah. And I, I hear we're changing to uh, international accounting, which is weaker. Uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Well, GAP was used uh, um, with a few important uh, provisos. First of all, GAP is used at the periodic accounting uh, moments, like quarterly statements and annual statements and things like that. The big issue that has arisen in this crisis is mark-to-market -market accounting. Uh, that means remarking assets to their market price day to day and sometimes hour by hour. Uh, there are people who believe, now what GAP says about that is very complicated, it depends on the type of institution, and in particular, uh, banks, when, when banks hold assets in their, uh, in the portfolio that they intend to retain to maturity, they do not have to mark them to market. That's consistent with GAP. The stockbrokers that we were talking about generally have to mark everything to a market. And if you move something into your trading account, which means take it from your right hand and put it in your left hand, you would then have to mark it to market under GAAP. There, there has been a major controversy brewing these last months over mark-to-market accounting. Some people blaming mark-to-market accounting for part of the problem. And the, the argument goes like this. Uh, I'm a bank. I'm sitting here with a bunch of assets. I'm not about to fire sale them. Then Merrill Lynch comes along and sells a bunch of assets for 22 cents on the dollar. Now my accountant shows up and says, you've got to mark your assets down to 22 cents on the dollar. And it has this kind of snowballing effect. That's the argument against mark-to-market accounting. The argument in favor of mark-to-market accounting uh, is twofold, basically, which is that um, if you don't mark them to market, what are you marking them to? Uh, you know, the alternative is mark to myth, and that can't be very good. And, but also, the second part of that argument, that they're twin, they're first cousins, is that a significant part of the fear that has gripped the financial markets is that nobody knows the real value of things on financial institutions' balance sheets. And the further you go from mark to market, the worse you make that problem. So my sympathies are in favor of mark to market, but there are lots of people that are, take, the other, uh, take the other view on that. Well, banks do both. There are certain things that are mark to market and certain things that are not mark to market. But under, the, under GAAP, securities companies have to mark everything to market. Uh, Professor Blinder, in a few days, the uh, leaders of the world's largest economies are going to be meeting to discuss the, the global financial crisis. What advice would you give them in terms of adjustments, changes to the uh, governance system for international finance? Yeah. Uh, I would actually only give one, because if it's an international, why only one? Most of these things that have to be done are domestic policy changes. 
Many of the things on the list that I, you know, I was making a U.S. list. Many of those things would apply to other countries to be done domestically. But there are a couple of things, one basically, that are on the international agenda, literally, and that has to do with cross-border supervision of big, complicated financial institutions, some of whom are banks, some of whom are investment banks, some of which are hedge funds, and so on. Uh, it is all too easy in the current fragmented, fragmented system for to wind up in a position where nobody really knows what's going on, say, at Citigroup. Citigroup's in 100 countries. The primary responsibility is in the United States. But frankly, it became clear in this uh, crisis that the people at the top of Citigroup didn't know what was going on in Citigroup. It was just too big, too far flung, and too complicated. You can therefore hardly expect the controller of the currency of the United States to really be on top of what's going on in Citigroup. That's one aspect. The other aspect has to do with, uh, um, um, what's the right way? I'm looking for a more judicious way to put this, but why don't I just say money laundering? I don't necessarily mean that literally. When we use the term money laundering literally, we're talking about an illegal activity for which you can go to jail. But there are lots of ways to hide transactions in other jurisdictions. That's what the Cayman Islands were invented for. Um, and unless we get more international cooperation, that will remain easy. And the countries of the world, the major financial countries of the world, need to get together and watch those international flows and monitor them much more carefully than is now being done. Sir. Oh, that's easy. We're borrowing it. Okay. Now that depends. Here, here, this I got the right slide up. The uh, the Secretary of the Treasury is supposed to invest this money in mortgages, mortgage-related securities, and other stuff. So that three is a big catch-all in which you can put a lot of things and General Motors stock may wind up in there. To the extent that this money is invested wisely, it will yield a return. If it's invested very wisely, you could even make a profit on this, but given the way it started, I wouldn't bet on that. But at minimum, a lot of the 700 should come back when the assets are sold. We don't want the Treasury forever owning these huge amounts of mortgages, mortgage-related assets, AIG stock, bank stock, General Motors stock. It should be selling all this back when the markets are more normal. And if you've bought low and sold high, you'll make a profit. But that assumes, I guess my question is one step back. If, as you said, you don't have a lot of confidence in the way the market is set up, it's done in the work, it's done in the Right, right. No. Oh, you mean the debt, the government debt? Oh, is that what you mean, the government? The government's Well, everybody in the world is buying it. The, 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 the rampant fear in the financial markets around the world has gotten every major investor in the world clamoring for U.S. government debt. It seems to be an insatiable demand. Oh. The other place Americans are going is into FDIC-insured bank deposits. Uh, and some foreigners are going into that also. But basically, the world demand is going into U.S. Treasuries. So it's really easy for us to borrow essentially unlimited amounts at pretty low, very low interest rates right now. What that tells you, by the way, is that nobody's worried about the imminent bankruptcy of the United States of America. Yeah, I'm not worried about I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about lots of other things, as you can tell. Well, that, that was my question, because uh, the more money we put into uh, uh, loans and maintenance of the United States, the more we have to pay the more risky looks these investments in, uh, in the United States. Correct. And the other side of this is that uh, since the beginning of the year, the dollar has been 
moving up, the more we seem to be going into these uh, uh, near bankrupt companies, the stronger the dollar gets. Is that right. operation? Or is it, is no. Because this is the last resort, and people still believe that the dollar is going to be there when everybody else is flat. Yes. The, the, the fact that the dollar is going up is a reflection of what I answered to the previous gentleman, which is that money all over the world is flooding into treasury bills. To buy U.S. treasury bills, you first have to convert your foreign currency to dollars. So that's what's driving up the value of the dollar. Now, to your point, to the extent that we invest this money poorly, not all of the 700 will flow back to American, uh, to the treasury and therefore the national debt will be higher. So it's anybody's guess how much that will be. It certainly is, we're certainly not gonna lose 700 billion. I don't know how much we might lose, but even 700 billion is only 5% of GDP. This is a big country. Uh, so even in a worst case, where they put the whole thing into junk bonds that are all defaults, and they never get a penny back on the 700 billion, which is of course not gonna happen, we lost 5%. We've added 5% of GDP to the national debt. In the other case, if the whole 700 comes back, we've added nothing to the national debt. Last question. What do you think about temporarily setting unemployment benefits at a very high percentage of lost wages? I love it. Write your congressman. It's one of the most effective ways to inject more spending as an anti-recessionary device into the economy. And the other thing we should do, by the way, I'm sorry Alan Kruger had to leave. He's the expert on unemployment insurance, is in the system, right now, 32% of the unemployed people in America are collecting unemployment insurance. 68% are not. That's just wrong. That doesn't happen in any other rich country in the world. And we should extend the eligibility and also make it more generous, both. <laughs>